Greetings and welcome back. We've seen how geocentrism fails to match even basic observations of the cosmos, and what happens when geocentrists try to explore space. We've seen how they're unable to present a simple, coherent model that explains all motions that we observe and measure. The application of simple, universal physics explains much that geocentrism can't, in that it explains everything that geocentrism can't, but how else do we know that Earth isn't the mysteriously inexplicable centre of the universe? Changes in Earth's position and velocity result in observable effects that are either explicable by a moving Earth or by more layers of hand-waving physics-defying horseshit. In this part, we'll find out which is most likely. Let's start with position. Everyone knows that if you move in any direction, nearby objects move within your field of view far more than distant ones. This apparent displacement of objects between different lines of sight is parallax, and it's the basis of our depth perception. Measuring the distance to an object using parallax is simply a case of trigonometry. If you want to know how far away some landmark is, you can move some distance b perpendicular to the original line of sight, and measure the change in angle needed to point at the landmark again. You can then work out the distance using the bog standard tangent formula, What's true for landmarks is true for anything else, at any distance. The more distant the object is, though, the smaller the angle of parallax. This initially posed problems, as even the nearest stars are so far away that the angles involved are very small. In the late 1500s, Tycho Brahe attempted to measure parallax. He started with the supernova of 1572, but being over 8,000 light-years away, it was beyond his ability to measure it. He didn't know that at the time, of course. He tried measuring parallax of stars, too, and failed. This isn't surprising when one considers that Brahe was working without a telescope. He died in 1601, before its invention in 1608. Brahe's measurements were as good as possible with the naked eye. His stellar and planetary positions were accurate to a mean error of two arc minutes. They were accurate enough for his assistant, Johannes Kepler, to determine that planets orbit the Sun in elliptical orbits, and to formulate his three laws of orbital motion, which we saw in part two. Limited to this degree of accuracy, though, Brahe simply stood no chance of measuring parallax. That doesn't stop geocentric conspiratards claiming a global conspiracy, because Brahe concluded the Earth was at rest. It might crap on their cornflakes, but it's simply no secret that he reached this conclusion. It should be obvious why a man trying to measure something beyond his ability to do so was likely to reach the wrong conclusion. Early telescopes weren't up to the job either, and mankind was busy discovering other things with them and refining the technology. It would take another two centuries before parallax was measured for the first time. In 1838, Friedrich Bessel succeeded with the star 61 Cygni. He derived its distance as 10.4 light-years, not far from more refined measurements of 11.41 light-years. Friedrich Struve measured the parallax of Vega, and Thomas Henderson measured it for Alpha Centauri in the same year. By the end of the 19th century, the parallax of only about 60 stars was known. Such is the precision required, plus the fact that astronomers simply couldn't know which stars would have parallax within the limits of their ability to measure it. As measuring techniques and the quality of equipment increased, so too did the accuracy with which parallax could be measured, and the number of stars for which it could be. Back to our simple formula. The longest baseline we can have on Earth is the distance to the Sun. So B is one astronomical unit. In astronomy, angles measured are very small. Degrees are subdivided into 60 minutes of 60 seconds. As angles tend towards zero, so too does the tangent of the angle. For very small angles, there is very little difference between them. Our parallax formula becomes d equals 1 over p. For parallax calculations, it is convenient to specify the angle in arc seconds. If a star has a parallax angle of 1 arc second, d would be 1 over 1. 1 watt. This is where a seemingly unusual but convenient unit of measurement comes from, the parsec. Even without knowing how far away the Sun is, we know by using the same simple trig that a star with a parallax angle of 1 arc second has to be 206,264.8 times further away than the Sun. Fortunately, we do know the distance to the Sun, so we know how far a parsec actually is. 
it's 3.26 light years. Our closest star, Proxima Centauri, has the largest parallax angle at 768.7 plus or minus 0.3 milliarc seconds. This gives a distance of 1.3 parsecs, or 4.24 light years. It is 268,329 times further away than the Sun, which is why for geocentrists it has to circle the Earth at 9,750 times the speed of light, as we saw in Part 3. For ground-based observations, the distortion caused by Earth's atmosphere makes it difficult to measure angles smaller than 0.01 arc seconds. This limits ranging to about 100 parsecs. Getting into space increases both the accuracy of measurements and the distances that can be measured. The Hipparchos satellite launched by ESA in 1989 measured the parallax of over 118,000 stars to an accuracy of 2 milliarc seconds. In October 2013, ESA will launch the Gaia spacecraft as the successor to Hipparchos. Among its objectives, it will map the position, distance and proper motion of a billion stars to an accuracy of 20 micro arc seconds, returning over 200 terabytes of data. How do geocentrists get around the wealth of measurements that have been made and continue to be made? It's a simple two-step program. One, ignore them. Two, make the empty claim that things and spies are closer than we're told. Yes, it's the good old conspiracies again. What evidence and reproducible measurements do they have to support this claim? No surprises there, then. Parallax simply demonstrates that such claims are nothing more than empty arguments from ignorance. For considering geocentrism, though, we really only need to consider the very simplest point, being the reason it occurs in the first place, the motion of the observer. The alternative for non-moving observers in the fantasy fixed Earth universe is that stars just happen to move from side to side against the background every year by an amount that is proportional to their distance. Not only that, but this motion must also be phased according to their position on the celestial sphere so as to provide parallax measurements consistent with a heliocentric Earth. And they must engage in this choreographed motion as independent objects whilst spinning round Earth once a day at hyperluminous speeds. As you've probably guessed, geocentrists have no physics to explain any of that either. Since parallax of stars is measurable, we know Earth is moving, and consequently we know that geocentrism is bollocks. As Earth orbits the barycentre of the solar system, its velocity changes due to the constant application of centripetal acceleration due to gravity. It was during the 1600s, and the first attempts to try and measure parallax, that another easier-to-measure phenomenon was discovered. In 1674, Robert Hooke published observations of Gamma Draconis changing position by 23 arc seconds between July and October. In 1680, following 10 years of measurements, French astronomer Jean-Félix Picard found that the position of Polaris varied by 40 arc seconds. John Flamsteed repeated the measurement nine years later. In the late 1720s, James Bradley and Samuel Molyneux also observed Gamma Draconis and measured the change in its apparent position. They found that it moved 40 arc seconds to the south from September to March, and then returned. This wasn't parallax, yet an annual change in the positions of stars was still being measured. This turned out to be annual aberration. The essence of aberration is that the velocity of an observer results in a change in the angle of incoming light, such that an observed object appears displaced from its true position. Bradley was the first to explain it in classical terms. The conclusive relativistic explanation would fall to Einstein nearly 200 years later. Observations of aberration share some common features with parallax observations. Stars on the ecliptic move back and forth in straight lines. Those near the ecliptic poles move in near circles mirroring Earth's orbit. Those in between move in ellipses whose eccentricity depends on their latitude from the ecliptic. There are, however, a few key differences. Firstly, the apparent displacement due to aberration is orthogonal to that of parallax. That's how early observers knew that the displacements they were seeing were due to something different. Secondly, the displacement caused by aberration is much larger, 
The semi-major axis of the ellipses described is around 20.5 arc seconds, rather than the fractions of an arc second or milli arc seconds seen with stellar parallax. Thirdly, the magnitude of the effect of aberration is the same for all stars, because the distance to a star does not matter, whereas the apparent shift due to parallax is proportional to its distance. In the century and a half before parallax would successfully be measured, the discovery of aberration provided another means of knowing that Earth is moving. Diurnal aberration is also measurable, though this is a complex feat. It is a result of Earth's rotation about its axis. So we know the Earth is rotating, and we know the Earth is moving and orbiting the Sun. What we also know, of course, is that the track record of geocentrism remains perfect. Perfectly bollocks. Aberration also allows us to work out the speed of Earth around its orbit. The accepted value of the constant of aberration is 20.49552 arc seconds. Taking a star that would appear directly overhead, we can use a reduced form of our earlier equations, where sine theta minus phi equals v over c. Theta minus phi is the angular displacement, converted into radians. V then is c sine theta minus phi, which, when we crunch the numbers, comes out as 29,789 meters per second. Let's check that by approximating Earth's orbit to a circle of radius 150 million kilometers. That gives a circumference of 942,477,796 kilometers. Divide the circumference by the number of seconds in one Earth orbit, and we get 29,865 meters per second. That's just 76 meters per second difference, or 0.26%. Let's try again with orbital mechanics. The mass of Earth is utterly negligible compared to that of the Sun, so its mean orbital speed is very nearly the square root of the universal gravitational constant times the mass of the Sun divided by the distance between the two in meters. Crunch those numbers out, and we get 29,749 meters per second. Hmm. In the 300 years that aberration has been measured, Technology has increased drastically in complexity and accuracy. Geocentrists, on the other hand, haven't. Geocentric explanations of parallax and aberration depend on an ether wind flowing around Earth as the universe rotates around it. They don't even attempt to explain why the effect of aberration differs dependent on a star's latitude from the ecliptic. Neither do they explain the change in direction of displacement throughout the year, or why a universe rotating around Earth once a day produces a cycle of aberration that is a year long. Neither do they explain why parallax displacement is orthogonal to that of aberration, or why they are phased according to a star's right ascension. That's what happens when you start with a holy book, and then try and make things fit it afterwards. In the geocentric universe, the Sky Fairy that created it clearly has a whacked out sense of humour, and, having created the laws of physics, then decided it would be absolutely brilliant to create a universe that, beyond Earth, only looked like it conformed to those laws, but actually was an alternative of such ludicrous complexity and physics-defying insanity that only fundamentalist asshats who didn't have a clue what Occam's razor could do for them would think that physics was wrong. The Sky Fairy created this elaborate illusion purely to test the faith of his creations, and so that all those who figured out the laws of physics would fail the test and burn in hell for not mindlessly subscribing to the ravings of some desert-dwelling goat fisters who had to steal their mythology from others. Or maybe, just maybe, sky fairies and geocentrism are a load of outdated bollocks with no place in the modern world, dependent on conjecture, laughable claims of conspiracies, and a glaring inability to actually explain basic aspects of the world or the universe of which it is part. In part 7, we'll look at more ways of knowing Earth is moving, and we'll see what happens when geocentrists try their hand at understanding the universe. See you then.